present Bernard Horsfall as Harry Lawson and Geoffrey Banks as Professor von Hardwig in A Journey to the Center of the Earth. The novel by Jules Verne, adapted for radio in eight parts by Howard Jones. Part eight, The Journey is Ended. And now I have reached the last chapter of our amazing and incredible adventure. Not that we realized it at the time, of course. There were, as my uncle said, some 5,000 miles between ourselves and the center of the earth. But there, perhaps I should first remind you who I am. My name is Harry Lawson, and my uncle is none other than that brilliant scientist, Professor von Hardwig of Hamburg. You may recall that he determined we should follow in the footsteps of a certain Anna Sacknesem, a 16th century alchemist, who had made a lone journey to the center of the earth. As you well know by now, my uncle is a man not to be denied. So off to Iceland we went, and accompanied by our faithful guide, Hans Bjelke, we descended the crater of the extinct volcano called Snæfels. I have described at length the many perils we faced in those underground passages and caverns. Then how we sailed on the great central sea and were there overwhelmed by a hurricane which drove us back to our starting point. Yet that was our good fortune. For we found close at hand the road taken 300 years before by Arna Sacknesen, the road to the center of the earth. To our dismay, the way ahead was blocked by a huge mass of granite. There was no way round it or under it or above it. Nor was there any hope of moving it with pickaxes. I said to the professor, There is another way. We will blast the rock to smithereens. Gunpowder. Yes. To work, Hans, to work. I call my own master. What is it you wish? Well, I have a crowbar and pickaxe. You are to make a cavity in the rock here, Hans. No, lower down, here. Yeah. A cavity big enough to hold 50 pounds of gun cotton. You understand? Oh, yes, I understand. A big hole here. I will see to it. Now, Harry, my boy, we must prepare a fuse of wick. Then we will wrap our explosive in a bag and pack it into the hole Hans is making. I'll see to it, Uncle. We'll succeed. We're bound to succeed. Of course we will succeed. When everything is in place, all we need is a spark. One tiny spark. And this wretched rock will be blown to atoms. Come, let us have everything ready. Then we may rest until tomorrow. The morrow was the 27th of August. And even now, so long afterwards, my heart beats wildly at the memory of that fearful day. At six o'clock in the morning, we were up and ready. I begged that I should be allowed to ignite the explosive, and my uncle agreed. Our plan was simple. The professor and Hans would wait on the raft, and there I would join them as soon as I had fired the fuse. We calculated that the fuse would burn for at least ten minutes before the explosion was touched off, and we should therefore have plenty of time to put out safely to sea. We made a good breakfast. Then the professor who, like myself, was a little on edge, asked abruptly. Uh, you are ready, Harry? Quite ready, Uncle. The lamp. You have a lamp to light the fuse. I have it here. <laughs> then be off, and heaven go with you. Be back as quickly as you can, my boy. I'm all impatient. Oh, don't worry, Uncle. I shan't dawdle. Give me a shout when you want me to fire the fuse. see my uncle watching me from the raft, chronometer in hand. I opened the lamp and ignited the fuse. It crackled and sparkled, hissed and spat like a serpent. I did not stay to watch it, but pelted for the shore. Well done, my boy. Hands cast off. It is done, master. There is little wind. I must use the pole. <laughs> With his long pole, Hans sent us flying over the water. My uncle never raised his eyes from the chronometer. 
In a few seconds, we were fully 40 yards from the beach. Then, five minutes to go. Four minutes. Three minutes. Two minutes. One minute. My uncle did not move. Half a minute to go. Twenty seconds. Ten. My uncle took up the count. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. No shattered pieces, you granite wall. then? Mercifully, my memory of those terrifying moments is dimmed. But it seemed to me that the rocks on the shore were torn aside like a curtain. The sea rose in a mountainous mass, the raft with it. We were thrown to the deck, and there was darkness all about us. The raft seemed to be hurtling down a gigantic well. I tried to speak, but could not. I could hear nothing but the roaring of the waters. Presently, my mind cleared a little. I began to understand what had happened. The explosion had created a sort of earthquake. Beyond the granite wall which we had shattered was an abyss. Doubtless, the road once followed by Sacknesson. Into this we had been hurled, dragging, as it were, the central sea with us. Time passed. We sat close, elbow to elbow, knee to knee, grasping each other's hands. The raft spun, struck the wall, sped on and on, down and down at horrifying speed. In my heart was the certainty that we were doomed. Presently, Hans spoke. Dark, dark. I do not like this dark. The room cost coil, Hans. Will it keep a light? No. It's smashed in pieces. We can't light a torch. That's certain. My torch will not keep burning. There's too much rain. But there is the lantern. Can you light it? Will it burn? We will see. We will see. Ah, there. He burns. It flickers in the wind. But here's something. He is better than the dark. Yes, Hans, yes. Better than the dark. We seemed now to be in a wide cavern, hurtling along at a speed, I truly believe, of a hundred miles an hour. My uncle and I stared wild-eyed at each other as we clung to the mast. Hours passed. I lost all count of time. Then it struck me that we should examine our cargo so that we had some idea of our resources. I spoke to Hanson. He answered, Cargo? I do not know. Well, let's see. Take the lamp, Hans. First, what are our scientific instruments? Here, the chronometer. Here's the compass. Nothing else. That's bad. What about ropes and tools? Mm, one little piece of rope tied to our mast. No pickaxes. No crowbars. No hammer. Nothing else. Food? You ask for food? Yes. How much food is left? Hey, there is this little piece of dried meat. There are these biscuits. What else? Nothing. There must be some more. There is nothing. Nothing. A piece of dried meat. A few wet and moldy biscuits. Terrified at the prospect of starvation, I searched the raft examined the cracks, poked between the beams, looked into every hole and corner. The result was nothing. Now I was desperate and terribly afraid. I stretched myself on the raft and watched the lamplight as it became fainter and fainter and finally burnt out. Perhaps then... I fainted. Perhaps I only slept. When I opened my eyes again, the darkness was complete. But something had happened whilst I slept. What was it? Silence. No roaring. No rushing waters. Then my uncle spoke. Hey. Sorry, my boy. Where are you? Here, uncle. Here is my hand. You realize what has happened? We are going upward. Upward? But that's impossible. We are going upward. Very fast. 
hands a torch. Can you light a torch? Perhaps. There is now no wind to blow him out. I think he will burn in a moment. Ah, he is a good flame. Bravo. Look, we go up, up in a, in a well. Yes, a well, a narrow vertical shaft. It is clear, Harry, that the waters of the Central Sea have flooded the bottom of the shaft and are now pushing us upward. Yes, Uncle. But the question is, where does this shaft end? As to that, I'm as ignorant as you. But I think we should be prepared for the worst. If there is no opening to this shaft, then we shall either be crushed against the granite roof or suffocated. As it is, I, I, I don't seem to breathe very well. It is a desperate situation, Harry. But I say, while well, there's life, there's but hope. Let us cheer ourselves. Let us eat. Eat? Eat, I say. Come and serve us some food. Oh, Master, it cannot be. Come, we all need food. Or do you, do you mean that our provisions are lost? Uh, is this handful of meat? There are these biscuits. All else is lost. You are sure, Hans? I am very sure, Master. Well, what do you think of our chances now, Uncle? I think, my boy, I think we must make up our minds to eat. It will do us no good to stare at these few scraps. Hans, pass me the meat and biscuits. If a man's heart beats, then I say he continues to hope. There. I have made three portions of the food. Your portion, Harry. Yours, Hans. What are you smiling at, Hans? Master, I have something here. Something to eat. Something to drink. A bottle of La Friedam, Friedam, Holland Chicken. Splendid, splendid. Approach the bottle, my good hands. Take a drink, then pass it around. <laughs> it is good. Very good. good. Uh, excellent. It will put strength to all of us. Good hands. For a long time, I lay still and silent. When I looked again at the chronometer, it was five o'clock in the morning. It seemed to me that the temperature about us was rising. And the air, or the lack of it, at times made breathing difficult. I said bitterly, Well, if we're not drowned or flattened like pancakes or, or don't starve, we shall have the satisfaction of being burned and alive. Mm, what is that, my boy? Yeah, Hans, give me the torch. I want to examine the walls of this shaft. Here, my master. Thank you. Mm, this is this eruptive granite. And we are Hill going up. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? I wondered what my uncle meant. Could he somehow calculate the thickness of the crust over our heads? He put his hand on the rocky walls of the shaft and muttered again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is silicate mineral. Good. Undoubtedly the transition period. What then? What then? As we ascended further, the heat became well nigh unbearable. We removed our jackets and waistcoats. Presently, I touched a rock and found it so hot that I plunged my hand into the water to cool it. Involuntary, I cried, Take care, the water's scalding. What, what Harry? The water, it's scalding. Is there a furnace up above us? Impossible. Try it, impossible. Then what does it mean? Where are we? Where are we going? Hans! Here is the compass. The thing's gone mad. First it points north, then south, now north again. That means the magnetism around us is in a state of flux. It means... That noise. You hear it? Not a frightening you, my boy. Don't you hear? Don't you realize the water we're floating on is almost boiling and the compass has gone mad? It must be an earthquake. I hope for something better than an earthquake. What do you mean? An eruption. I have every reason to think we are in the shaft of a crater, in full volcanic action and vigor. And I beg to tell you that it is the most fortunate thing that could happen to us. Fortunate? You say we're about to be vomited from the earth with flames, rocks, cinders, and you call it fortunate? Certainly. It is the only chance we have of escaping into the light of day. I tried to calm myself, to think things out logically and sensibly. My uncle was right, absolutely right. We were being thrust up through the Earth's crust, not on this occasion in an extinct volcano like Snaples, but in a mountain of a fire in full activity. From Cape Sacknesem, we had been swept northward many hundreds of leagues. 
Where then were we now? Under Iceland? Should we be belched up through Mount Hecla? Or through one of the other seven fire funnels of the island? But what did it matter? We were doomed anyway. Towards morning, our speed of ascent increased still more. The vertical gallery became wider and wider. To right and left, I could discern long, dark corridors emitting thick and suffocating vapors and flickering tongues of flame. This, I thought, this surely is the end. My uncle, however, was not in the least perturbed. My dear boy, it is merely burning sulfur. That is the common thing with a volcanic eruption. But if the flames engulf us... They will not engulf us. Well, I suppose it's all the same. Whether we choke to death, burn to death, or drown in scalding water. There is no water. We are rising on a bed of lava. What is the time, good hands? Eight o'clock, master. Eight o'clock of the morning. Strange. It's gone very quiet. What's happened? We do not go up anymore. Well, that is what happens. The eruption has stopped. We are not moving. Do not be alarmed. Before we are many minutes older, we shall continue our journey to the mouth of the crater. We are concerned with a volcano. The, the, the eruption is intermittent. It is compelled to breathe, just as we do. Ah, here we go again. Hang on tight, my friends. Hang on tight. We ascended and stopped. Ascended and stopped again. I cannot say how many times the process was repeated. The heat became intense. I sweated from every pore. I must have become lightheaded, for I remember dimly how the powerful arms of Hans suddenly clutched me. Be still, Master Harry, be still. For the race will take your head on the wall for the shaft. Everything is all right. It is all right. I have only a confused recollection of continual detonations, of the shaking of the granite walls, of the raft whirling like a spinning top as it floated on a stream of hot lava. <laughs> Huge flames roaring all about us. Blowing from the secret furnaces of the earth. My heart throbbing with terror. This is all I remember. When I opened my eyes, I felt Hans clutching me by the belt. With the other hand, he supported my uncle. I realized presently that I was lying on a mountain slope, scarcely two paces from a gully into which I would surely have slipped at the first false step. I was not hurt, but stiff, bruised all over. Like a man rousing from a dream, my uncle asked, Where? Yeah. Where are we? Who can tell, Master? In Iceland? Nah, no, not Iceland. How do you know? Look about you, Master. We should be at Spitsbergen, I thought. I expected to see a snow-covered cone and widespread glaciers. But no. Here was sunlight. Intense, warming, piercing sunlight. We had been cast from the crater half naked and I could feel the warmth of the sun soaking through and through my body. After some delay, the professor spoke. Hmm. No, it really does not look like Iceland. Perhaps it's the island of Jan Mayen. Oh, out of the question, my boy. This is not a northern volcano. Oh, it's easy to say that, Uncle, but you can't be sure. Look, my boy, down to the base of the mountain. Now, what do you see? Trees. What trees? You recognize them? Could be olives. Figs. Exactly. And yonder they are vines loaded with grapes. And now, as my eyes became accustomed to the brilliant light, 
I saw beneath me the waters of a sea or lake which made an island of this enchanted land. Over towards the rising sun was a small port clustered with houses. Strange-looking boats were anchored in the harbor. Far beyond, numerous small islands could be seen, so many that I was reminded of bees about a beehive. To the west lay a distant mountainous coastline, with one prodigiously lofty cone surmounted by heavy clouds. To the north, there was nothing but water, sparkling in the sun. I asked, where can we be? Now, wherever we are, it is rather warm. And what is more, the volcano is erupting. And I see no sense in staying here to receive a piece of rock upon my head. Let us descend and find somebody who will tell us where we are. Ah, to tell the truth, I feel I'm dying of thirst and hunger. Forward, Hans. Forward. We slithered over piles of ashes, avoiding the streams of hot lava which glided horribly beside us like serpents. As we slipped and scrambled, I said, We must be somewhere in Asia. On the coast of India, perhaps, on Malaya. We've crossed through the globe and come out at the Antipodes. But the compass, my boy. Explain the compass. It always pointed north. I, I can't explain it. It's a mystery. No mystery at all. The compass lied. The compass lied? How do you know? Because <laughs> if it didn't lie, we are now at the North Pole. <laughs> Does that strike you as reasonable? I did not know what to think. Nor did I much care, for I too was tormented with thirst and hunger. After a two hours' march, we reached a beautiful spread of country where olives, pomegranates, and vines abounded. What a delight it was to press these fruits to our lips. Not far off, near some fresh and mossy grass, I found a spring of fresh water. And here we paused to wash our hands, feet, and faces. While we were doing this, a small boy appeared between two tufted olive trees. I cried, Ah, here's a small inhabitant of this happy land. Boy! Boy! Here, runs away. Hey, catch him, hands. Catch him. I will. Boy, come here. Come here. The boy was poorly dressed and terribly scared at our appearance. <laughs> and who would blame him? Half naked with tangled hair and ragged beards, we must have looked very ill-favored in his young eyes. Hans caught up with him and dragged him back. Here he is, but he will not speak. Nothing will he say. Let me try, Hans. Wie heißt dieser Berg? He does not speak, so we are not in Germany. Boy, what is the name of this mountain? Hm. Is he down, I wonder? Let us try a little Italian on him. Dove noi siamo? Boy, must I give you a good shaking to loosen your tongue? Come si noma questa isola. Stromboli! Stromboli! Stromboli. So we were in the central Mediterranean, amidst the eastern archipelago of mythological memory, in the ancient Strongylos, where Aeolus chained up the wind and the tempest, and those blue mountains which rose towards the rising sun were the mountains of Calabria. And that mighty volcano which rose on the southern horizon was the fierce and celebrated Etna. Oh, what a journey. What a marvelous and extraordinary journey we had made. For we had entered the earth by one volcano and had come out by another. More than 1,200 leagues from Snowfoss. So was our great adventure ended. There is little more for me to add. We were kindly received by the fishermen of Stromboli, and after a rest of 48 hours, we started our homeward journey. On the 9th of October, we arrived in Hamburg, and here our faithful Hans bade us farewell and departed for his native Iceland. Shortly, too, I married my uncle's goddaughter, my dearest, my ever-beloved Gretchen, though that... As they say, is another story. My uncle's greatness as both a scientist and an explorer was speedily recognized. Hamburg gave a festival in our honor. 
A public meeting of the Jahanneum Institute was held at which the professor related the full story of our adventures, omitting only the mystery in connection with our lying compass. Ah, that compass. Why did it point to the south instead of to the north? It baffles me, Harry. It baffles me. I think I can explain it now, Uncle. You can? Yes. For six months now, it has lain untouched and unnoticed here in your study. As you see, the needle still points to the south. Well, bless me, so it does. But why, my boy? Why? Because during that hurricane on the Central Sea, we encountered a ball of fire. Remember? Of course I remember. But what does that to do with it? A ball of fire turned our raft into a magnet, didn't it? And likewise, Uncle, it turned the compass topsy-turvy. So it was a trick of the electricity. Brilliant, Harry, brilliant. Ha! Now I am happy. You have cleared up for me the one great mystery of our journey. Our unforgettable journey to the center of the earth. and last installment of A Journey to the Center of the Earth, adapted by Howard Jones from the novel by Jules Verne. The cast was as follows. Harry Lawson was played by Bernard Horswell, Professor von Hartwig by Geoffrey Banks, and Hans Bjolke by John Daglish. It was produced in the north of England by Trevor Hill. Tomorrow in Storytime on Radio 4 at 5.25, you'll be able to hear the third installment of The Flight of the Heron by D.K. Broster, which has been abridged for reading on radio in eight parts, and tomorrow's episode is called The Flood Tide. That's tomorrow.